Edward Gibbon, the Gib, as he liked to sign himself in his letters, or sometimes the Gibbon. His calling card was philosophe et historien. And that doesn't just mean philosopher like, you know, Bertie Russell or uh, A.J. Eyre or someone. To be a philosophe in the 18th century meant to be someone who had something serious to say about the manners of the past, the present and the future, something of importance to say about what civilization was, or indeed how empires rise and fall. He wrote for the quality. He wrote for his friends. He wrote for people of fashion and taste. He didn't write for the masses. He didn't think he'd be read by the masses. But boy, did he write 3,000 pages, six volumes. It's the fruit of absolute colossal research in many, many different languages. It was at Oxford that his life really changed, not because of what he was learning there, but because of what he didn't learn there. He talked witheringly about the deep and dull potations of the dons, quite unlike today, of course. And when you went to history in the 18th century, there was one overwhelming fact that greeted you, with one exception of reading the rather light-hearted generalizations of Voltaire, whom Gibbon knew and admired a lot. And that was the people who knew most were the people who were most boring to read. Erudition was worn incredibly, incredibly heavily. And Gibbon conceived that he needed, in some sense, to dispense a certain kind of amused wisdom in the form of a lesson about the past. And I will show you the story of the greatest edifice which purported to be built on something as strong as Roman roads and Roman engineering and the most colossal armies the world has ever seen and see how, in fact, actually, it depended on the preposterous antics of a few men who actually believed for a while they were gods. It was at Rome on the 15th of October, 1764, as I sat musing amidst the ruins of the Capitol, while the barefoot friars were singing vespers in the Temple of Jupiter, that the idea of writing the decline and fall of the city first started to my mind. My temper is not very susceptible of enthusiasm, but I can neither forget nor express the strong emotions which agitated my mind as I first approached and entered the Eternal City. After a sleepless night, I trod with lofty step the ruins of the Forum. Each memorable spot where Romulus stood, or Tully spoke, or Caesar fell was at once present to my eye. And several days of intoxication were lost or enjoyed before I could descend to a cool and minute investigation. In the second century of the Christian era, the empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth and the most civilized portion of mankind. The public highways issued from the Forum of Rome, traversed Italy, pervaded the provinces, and were terminated only by the frontiers of the empire. According to Dr. Templeman's survey of the globe, it contained above 1,600,000 square miles for the most part a fertile and well-cultivated land. But I distrust both the doctor's learning and his maps. The obedience of the Roman world was uniform, voluntary and permanent. The terror of the Roman arms added weight and dignity to the moderation of the emperors. They preserved peace by constant preparation for war, and it is prettily remarked by an ancient historian who had fought against them that the effusion of blood was the only circumstance which distinguished a field of battle from a field of exercise. The system of the imperial government, as it was instituted by Augustus, may be defined as an absolute monarchy disguised by the forms of a commonwealth. Augustus was sensible that mankind is governed by names, that the Senate and people would submit to slavery, provided they were respectfully assured that they still enjoyed their ancient freedom. 
the long peace and the uniform government of the Romans introduced a slow and secret poison into the vitals of the empire. The minds of men were gradually reduced to the same level, the fire of genius was extinguished, and even the military spirit evaporated. It was scarcely possible that the eyes of contemporaries should discover in the public felicity the latent causes of decay and corruption. The last emperor to reign over this happy and prosperous period in the history of the world was Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. At the age of 12 years, he had embraced the rigid system of the Stoics, which taught him to submit his body to his mind, his passion to his reason. But his excellent understanding was often deceived by the unsuspecting goodness of his heart. His wife, Faustina, has been as much celebrated for her gallantries as for her beauty. Her unbounded passion for variety often discovered personal merit in the meanest of mankind, choosing sailors and gladiators for her wanton levity. Marcus was the only man in the empire who seemed ignorant or insensible of her irregularities. In his meditations, he thanks the gods who had bestowed on him a wife so faithful. After her death, the obsequious senate, at his earnest request, declared her a goddess, and it was decreed that on the day of their nuptials, the youth of either sex should pay their vows before the altar of their chaste patroness. The world laughed at the credulity of Marcus, but Madame Dacia assures us, and we may credit a lady, that the husband will always be deceived if the wife condescends to dissemble. Commodus, the beloved son of Marcus, succeeded to his father amidst the acclamations of the Senate and armies. But nature had formed him of a weak disposition. His timidity rendered him the slave of his attendants, who gradually corrupted his mind. A fatal incident decided his fluctuating character. One evening, as he was returning to the palace through a dark and narrow portico in the amphitheatre, an assassin rushed upon him with a drawn sword, loudly exclaiming, The Senate sends you this! The assassin was seized by the guards, but his words sunk deep into the mind of Commodus and left an indelible impression of fear and hatred against the whole body of the Senate. When uh, my father was dying, I spoke to the guards saying, I'm not like my father. Suspicion was equivalent to proof, trial to condemnation. The execution of a senator was attended with the death of all who might lament or revenge his fate. Now! And when Commodus had once tasted human blood, he became incapable of pity or remorse. His cruelty degenerated into habit and at length became the ruling passion of his soul. Cleander! He abandoned the reins of empire to unworthy favourites and valued nothing except the unbounded licence of indulging his sensual appetites. His hours were spent in a seraglio of 300 beautiful women and as many boys. And wherever the arts of seduction proved ineffectual, the brutal lover had recourse to violence. The ancient historians have expatiated on these abandoned scenes of prostitution, which scorned every restraint of nature or modesty. But it would not be easy to translate their too faithful descriptions into the decency of modern language. The intervals of lust were filled up with the basest amusements, the sports of the circus and amphitheatre, the combat of gladiators and the hunting of wild beasts. The servile crowd, 
whose fortune depended on their master's vices, applauded these ignoble pursuits. The perfidious voice of flattery reminded him that by exploits of the same nature, by the defeat of the Nemean lion and the slaughter of the wild boar of Erymanthus, the Grecian Hercules had acquired a place among the gods. Commodus eagerly embraced the glorious resemblance and styled himself, as we still read on his medals, the Roman Hercules. The club and the lion's hide were placed by the side of the throne amongst the ensigns of sovereignty, and statues were erected in which Commodus was represented in the character of the god whose valour and dexterity he endeavoured to emulate in the daily course of his ferocious amusements. Whether he aimed at the head or heart of the animal, the wound was alike certain and mortal. With arrows whose point was shaped into the form of a crescent, Commodus intercepted the rapid career and cut asunder the long bony neck of the ostrich. He killed a camelopardalis, or giraffe, the tallest, the most gentle, and the most useless of the large quadrupeds. The dens of the amphitheatre disgorged at once a hundred lions, a hundred darts from the unerring hand of Commodus laid them dead as they ran raging round the arena. <laughs> Neither the huge bulk of the elephant nor the scaly hide of the rhinoceros could defend them from his stroke. In all these exhibitions, the securest precautions were used to protect the person of the Roman Hercules from the desperate spring of any savage beast who might possibly disregard the dignity of the emperor and the sanctity of the god. <laughs> Some degree of applause was deservedly bestowed on the uncommon skill of the imperial performer. But the meanest of the populace were affected with shame and indignation when they beheld their sovereign enter the lists as a gladiator, and glory in a profession which the laws and manners of the Romans had branded with the justice note of infamy. He chose the habit of the secutor, whose combat with the retiarius formed one of the most lively scenes in the bloody sports of the amphitheatre. The secutor was armed with a helmet, sword and buckler. His naked antagonist had only a large net and a trident. With the one he endeavoured to entangle, with the other to dispatch his enemy. If he missed the first throw, he was obliged to fly from the pursuit of the secutor till he had prepared his net for a second cast. The emperor fought in this character 735 times. It may be easily supposed that in these engagements the master of the world was always successful. He now disdained the appellation of Hercules. The name of Paulus, a celebrated secutor, was the only one which delighted his ear. It was inscribed on his colossal statues and the mournful and applauding senate were obliged to repeat 626 times Paulus, first of the secutors, Paulus, first of the secutors, Paulus, first of the secutors. Commodus had now attained the summit of vice and infamy. His cruelty proved at last fatal to himself. Marcia, his favourite concubine, Eclectus, his chamberlain, and Lytus, the prefect of his Praetorian guard, alarmed by the fate of their companions and predecessors, resolved to prevent the destruction which every hour hung over their heads from the mad caprice of the tyrant. Marcia seized the occasion of presenting a draught of wine to her lover after he had fatigued himself with hunting some wild beasts. Commodus retired to sleep, but whilst he was labouring with the effects of poison and drunkenness, a robust youth, by profession a wrestler, entered his chamber and strangled him without resistance. 
Such was the fate of the son of Marcus Aurelius, and so easy was it to destroy a hated tyrant. The conspirators resolved instantly to fill the vacant throne with an emperor whose character would justify the action that had been committed. They fixed on Pertinax, prefect of the city, an ancient senator of consular rank who modestly pointed out several noble senators more deserving than himself of the empire, but was constrained by their dutiful violence to ascend the throne, confirmed by the most sincere vows of fidelity. The memory of Commodus was branded with eternal infamy. Amidst the general joy, the sullen and angry countenance of the Praetorian guards betrayed their inward dissatisfaction. They had reluctantly submitted to Pertinax. They dreaded the strictness of the ancient discipline which he was preparing to restore, and they regretted the license of the former reign. On the 28th of March, 86 days after the death of Commodus, a general sedition broke out in the camp. Two or three hundred of the most desperate soldiers marched at noonday with arms in their hands and fury in their looks towards the imperial palace. On the news of their approach, Pertinax, disdaining either flight or concealment, advanced to meet his assassins. For a few moments they stood in silent suspense, awed by the venerable aspect and majestic firmness of their sovereign, till at length the despair of pardon revived their fury. A barbarian of the country of Tongres levelled the first blow against Pertinax, who was instantly dispatched with a multitude of wounds. His head, separated from his body and placed on a lance, was carried in triumph to the Praetorian camp. The Praetorians had violated the sanctity of the throne by the atrocious murder of Pertinax. They dishonoured the majesty of it by their subsequent conduct. <laughs>